So RNA sequencing is essentially doing what I've talked about for genome sequencing, but using cDNA libraries. And so you can generate millions of reads. The uh, advantage of RNA-seq over microarray, which was all the rage 10 or 15 years ago, is that you don't need to know anything about the genome to start with. You, although it's helpful to actually have a reference, as you'll see. Um, but it also gives you a lot more information about the RNA. So there are things that you can learn about the RNA that are not just about its abundance. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Um, I like to say that you make different RNA-seq libraries for different purposes. So if you want to look, if you wanted to look at small RNAs, you or fragmented messenger RNAs, you put the linkers on the ends of them and you make cDNA that way. If you want to look at, at abundance of uh, RNAs, you might make random cDNA libraries, or you might enrich by poly AT, poly oligo DT to get rid of ribosomal RNAs, which is generally a good idea. In trypanosomatids, we have a big advantage that most other organisms do, don't have, is that we can enrich for the 5' end by using the splice leader sequence to amplify your second, to make your second set. And so this is actually very useful, as you'll see in a moment, to pull out the uh, Leishmania-specific sequences out of, um, and separate them from mouse or human if you've got a mouse to go. And then finally, ribosome profiling is a different type of RNA-seq that's useful for actually uh, looking at, at translation. Uh, there are a number of problems that you have to worry about, and I'll sort of skip over these. You can look at the slides later on, but you know, you, your RNA that can't be degraded, and you need uh, moderately small, small amounts. of This is going down and down. You can get away with very small amounts now. You need to be able to deplete the RNA, uh, or you'll find that you're getting a lot of RNA sequence, ribosomal RNA sequence and not very much messenger RNA, but there are lots of different methods available and, and the choice of what to use will, will depend. There are actually studies out that I've shown here that I won't go into detail about what this particular person said was the best. Frankly, probably what's most important is what kit you can buy uh, for the right price. The sequencing part is the easy part. It's the analysis that's difficult. So I'm not actually going to talk about the sequencing. I will give you a little bit of a story about the analysis. So, so what do you have? You have to put together a pipeline to actually take the sequence, which will be voluminous. It will be tens to hundreds of gigabytes of DNA, of, of sequence. So for every file, and you'll see this today, I've, I've done, for each sample, you've probably got two to... Uh, or 10 or 20 gigabytes of, of um, data that you have to process. And the processing will generate at least that much again, probably more. So don't think that you're going to do this on your laptop. <laughs> well, actually, you can do one or two things on your laptop, but it soon fills up. Uh, so basically what you have to do is you have to take the, uh, the sequence and you have to do a quality check to make sure it's worthwhile proceeding. Then you have to map it to your genome then you have to usually count the number of reads for each transcript. And then you have to do some statistical analyses to find out, you know, are the differences between the two conditions you see, are they real and reproducible? Uh, and then you might do a whole pile of experiment-specific analyses. So there are pipelines that exist or that you'll generally, in my experience, most people will string together a bunch of publicly available programs and write full scripts of, that link them all together to do what they want to do. Um, and usually you don't, it's not much good getting that from someone else because they won't have done exactly what you want to do. So you need to have a bioinformatician who can do what you want to do. But you have to have a good idea of what you want to do as well. Because in my experience, the bioinformatics people don't know enough about the biology to do things in a sensible way, and the biologists don't know about the bio, enough about the bioinformatics to know when they're being told it's rubbish or whether it's actually meaningful. So you need someone who can translate, at least. OK, so quality checking. Because you want to check to make sure that your read quality is good. You want to make sure that you've not got all of your sequences being the same, and you want to filter out the bad reads. So this is what one representation of a short, and this is actually a very short, a 36 nucleotide read uh, back in the day when Illumina only had really short reads. This is a representation of what it might look like. 
Um, and each read is basically, each, it's a discrete ordered set of nucleotides, and each base will get a quality score, which will tell you. So the file that you get looks like this. It's a text file that basically has about 40 million sets of pairs of rows that tells you the name of the, the read, what its sequence is, and then corresponding to that is what the quality score is. So each of these symbols tells you what the quality is. So here, an I probably means you have a quality of 40, which means you have a very low chance of an error, whereas this dollar sign means you've probably got a higher chance of error. So that's, that's what you'll get back from the sequencing center. And you'll use a program to, to do this. So here, so this is the average quality score at each position. So you can see that you've got good quality pretty much all the way out to the end of the read. This is what the uh, average base is. You, what you should do is see, for most uh, cases, this should be the same across the entire genome. You can tell that this is not Leishmania because the GC composition is quite low. This is actually plasmodium, I think. Um, you'll see that there's a little bit of bias here at the beginning, and that's that there are non-random reads there because of the way the library was made. We don't tend to do that any, anymore. Here you can see from this that the quality started to go really bad at base pair number 40. So something happened on this read, and you can see here that there's a lot of ends being called at position 53, and something weird happened at this position. So something happened in this read, and perhaps what happened was that the sequencing reagents ran out at, at position 42. So you might not want to use this data set because it's going to be pretty dodgy, this sequence out here. So you might not even use this. And you send it back to the sequencing principle and say, run it again and don't charge it. Um, here's an example of uh, where, when I, I did the plot, instead of getting sort of a, a, a random read, I could actually all read the sequence just by going at the, uh, looking at each, the sequence at each base. And when I looked at the top thousand most frequent um, sequences, 98% of them were all the same sequence. And so what turns out, this was right assembly RNA. So this was a useless library. Right? So 14, 13 and a half thousand reads came from the small ribosomal RNA subunit, so out of you know, 15 million reads. So that was not a good library. This happened completely randomly? Uh, this was back when we were just working out the technique, so now we don't see that anymore. I, I'm, I'm giving you all of the problems that you might encounter when you first do this, although most of you will actually be sending off the RNA-seq to a facility that will know what they're doing, but sometimes they they make mistakes. We still have mistakes with, with uh, in fact, we had one the other day where they forgot to add the primer, and so we got no sequence in the first, direct, first uh, direction. Mm -hmm. um, but let's say you, you, your sequence, your library looks good, you can go ahead and map it to your genome. As I said before, there are lots of different mappers that you can use for RNA. Some of them will deal with splicing and some won't, and, that, and with for it doesn't really matter. To worry about splicing, so you can use any of them. I like to use bow tie, others use BWA, there are whole piles of them. Generally, you're going to end up with BAM files, and we'll play with BAM files today. This is sort of the accepted standard of, of you've aligned the genome, the sequence to the genome, this, the BAM files contain the alignment information. And they're a little bit smaller than the sequence file, but not much smaller. Um, I won't even bother reading this. The different alignment tools enable you to do different things. Probably you should work out what's going on, or at least have your bioinformatics person work out what's the best for your, your situation, and then don't change it. Um, but if you change your question, you'll have to potentially change the, the parameters a little bit. Um, and so it's an iterative process. You do the alignment, you figure out whether it's telling you what you want, and then you might want to change it. But once you've got what works, keep it, keep it the same. Um, I don't think I'll go over the, um, the alignment here, or maybe I'll give you a slight thing. Is your alignment will enable you to either look for uh, 
it will put the reads into one of these bins. So some reads won't have match anything in the target index, and those you'll probably never look at again, except if you want to look for RNA viruses or something. There, hopefully, most of your reads will match exactly against only one location. And so those, you know where they are. But there will be a fair number of them, even in large media, there will be 10 or 20% of your reads that will give you multiple hits, and they can hit between twice in the genome to any number of times, hundreds of times. Uh, and some of them will hit against a lot of times. These ones you probably will throw away. These ones you have to decide what to do with. And you have a choice of um, changing your parameters to make them more stringent so you get fewer of these, but missing real hits versus making the parameters looser and having too many hits. So you, you'll have to choose what to do there. And there's no best method. <coughs> Um, you can look at this alignment data here and find out what, you know, you can get some information from that. Um, and here is, a, I think, the same example that I had before, is that I, the, the reads all align very well up to position uh, 41. And then they started to do something weird. They, they didn't match. There were a lot of mismatches at, at cycle 41. And what happened, it turned out here, that the sequencer actually paused overnight because the hard drive got full. And then the next morning when they started it in, the sequencing machine lost track of where it was and it recounted cycle number 41. So, so basically, the position 42 was the same as position 41, and of course now it has an extra base compared to the reference, and so nothing aligned. And I think we actually had to throw these out at the end of the day. We could have rescued them, but I don't think we bothered. Once you've aligned them to the genome, you need to count the number of transcripts, and there are a whole pile of programs that you can use to do that, um, that do it in slightly different ways. You can choose whichever one you want. You're probably going to have to customize them yourself and then run R scripts to pull all this data out in a way that's actually interpretable. A lot of people like to use reads per kilobase per million reads as RPKM, and you'll see that a lot. Personally, I don't think that this is all that useful. Um, it's a way of normalizing, but in my opinion, it doesn't actually normalize very well. Uh, and for trypanosomes, I don't think it's very useful. Um, but there's arguments in the field about, about doing that. So you need to talk with your bioinformatics person because they'll probably want to do this. I don't like to do that. I like to go back to the step before that. Once you've done your, once you've counted your number of reads, then you have to do statistical analysis to first of all normalize them because you've got different num the libraries will all have different numbers of sequences in them. So you can't just count the reads and compare them because you'll get it'll be dependent on the number of reads that are in the library, and that's what the RPKM is supposed to correct for, but in my opinion, it doesn't correct for it very well. And there are many programs uh, that will do this, do the normalization in different ways, and I think my favorite two are EdgeR and DEC, and I actually prefer EdgeR. Uh, it'll do statistics on you, for you. EdgeR, you need to have at least one of the samples needs to be done in duplicate. Um, so there is a big question in the field as to how many repeats you need to do. Most people nowadays do it in triplicate. I think you don't need to do that. I think if you do it in, have one sample that you've done in duplicate, you'll find out that, you know, if you do them again, they'll probably be fine. What's more important is, if you do, if you try to compare the reads that you generated in one experiment with the reads that you generated in another experiment, you'll almost certainly come up with a false answer because there are, there's a lot of um, library bias. So really, you should try to do all of the samples that you want to analyze should be in from, done at the same time in the same light, same, made in the same time and run on the same sequencer. Because uh, it's going to be much more difficult to com compare across libraries. And then you can do a lot of experimental specific analyses. For instance, you might be interested in what strand the read is on, and in Lashmania, we're like that. Lashmania, this is something you only look at in TRIPS, is where the splice leader site is, and whether there are changes in that position. And then, obviously, ribosome profiling is a, a completely different set of experiments. So, I, I'm going to skip over these. You can, you can look at this and look at the papers if you want to, but 
people have done analyses as to what they think is the best, and you know, someone else will do an analysis and have their other favorite. And in reality, what will really matter is what your bioinformatics person likes to do. Um, so that's, uh, you know, it's important for you to understand what, what's happening, but you probably don't have that much control. So in trypanosomatids, this is my opinion of what you can do and what you should do. If you want to look at transcript mapping, you can look at small RNAs and fragments to sample all of the transcripts because you don't want to perhaps just look at the poly A plus, although in trips almost all RNAs have poly A at the end of them except for the ribosomes. And even they have uh, some are polyethylated. But in trips you can look at splice leader. Uh, you can use splice leader priming to map the 5 prime ends of RNAs and I think that's important both for counting the number of reads but also more importantly to counting how often one splice slide is used relative to another one. Uh, and then you can use oligo GT priming to map the three prime ends. I found that to be less useful. Um, most of the time, this is what you're going to want to do. If you want to want to count the number of, you want to compare the transcript abundance under two conditions. And you can use either splice lead RNA seq or fragmented uh, messenger RNA seq. I will warn you that they won't give you the same answer. And it's not entirely clear to me why they don't give you the same answer. I have clues, but they, they won't give you exactly the same answer. So, because they're measuring two different things. Um, probably nowadays, this is what everyone else does because they don't have splice leaders. This gives you extra information and it gives you some, some things that you can do that you can't do in using other methods. Mostly, I actually use both of them together. We, the way we make our libraries, we make half of the library. We use the same sample and we make a fragmented message RNA library and we make a splice lead library and we do both of them. And if they're consistent between the two, that gives you extra confidence that you've got a real change. Splice leader RNA cycle, uh, libraries will give you alternative sl splicing, which, as we'll see in a moment, can be important. And then ribosomal profiling used to correct annotation, but it, more importantly, it measures the translation rate of mess each message RNA. And we'll see in a moment that the Changes in the level of the message RNA don't necessarily mean there's a change in the protein level and vice versa. Uh, I don't, probably don't need to go over this for everyone. Um, polycystronic transcription is important in, in Leishmania. Um, and you have a 5 prime splice leader and a 3 prime poly A. I should put that earlier. So initially, when we did these, we did lots of libraries. There were lots of splice leader libraries and lots of poly A plus libraries. And we basically were defining genes. And we did that in uh, lots of different libraries. And most of this I've never even published. Uh, now everyone else is publishing, so it's probably not ever going to see the light of day. I have to try to submit most of this to TriTripTB at some stage. Some of it's in of my data is in TriTripTB. Some, some is not. Uh, but essentially. We've used this to map the 5' prime and 3' prime boundaries of the genes. And why is that important? Uh, well, it's important because you can't actually predict that from the genome sequence. What you predict from the genome sequence, as I told you, is what's the coding sequence. And as we'll see in a moment, even that's not entirely accurate. Um, so these gave us high coverage of the, of the libraries. Even 5 or 10 years ago when I started doing this, we'd get most of the genes. Um, and what we found was that most genes have a single major splice leader site. So for 2,500 out of the uh, 8,000 genes, no, over 90% of the, of the reads were at a single splice leader site. But that meant that another two-thirds of them, there was more than one splice leader site. But one of them was usually the major site. Whereas, on the other hand, most RNAs had two or three different poly A sites that had about the similar abundance. So the poly, the, the poly A site, the three prime end of the gene of the message RNA, is not a single site in most genes in trypanosomes. Whether that's important or not, it's hard to know. And when I say they're not at the same site, they're usually with, within a few bases of one another. But sometimes they could vary by um, you know, hundreds of, of base pairs. Uh, Typically, the splice leader site was within the first 500 nucleotides upstream of the CDS, whereas the poly A site was much more uh, variable. Most messenger RNAs have a poly A site that's close to the 3' prime end of the CDS, but several of them have very long 3' prime UTIs. And so 
this long three prime UTRs are probably important for regulation. And importantly, you won't get this from the genome sequence. You can't predict that. You have to actually have experimental data. And that is beginning to get into tri-50B for some genomes. But most genomes in tri-50B won't have this data associated with them. Now, here's an important point right here. About 5% of the genes, the splice leader side, is actually downstream of the annotated ATG. So what that tells you is that the messenger RNA that comes from this coding sequence doesn't actually contain the 5' prime end of the coding sequence. What does that tell you? Blank looks. What it tells you is that the we chose the wrong ATG for the start codon, is that the first few amino acids here don't actually exist in the protein. And we'll come, I'll come back to that. So be careful. Be careful if you want to assume that your particular gene, I'm going to make an antibody, let's say, against the first, the, the N terminus of the protein, because that actually may not be in the protein. And about 5% of the time, it's not. So, so actually, five percent of the CDS are uh, wrongly annotated. That is correct. For most of the genomes, it's about that. Some of them are better than that because they've been corrected by uh, RNA seq data. But that's not for for most genomes. You'll about five percent of the genes will be wrong. Luckily, in trypanosomatids, the three prime in it is almost always correct. Now. You're lucky you work on trypanosomes. If you work on any other parasitic organism, that number is probably much worse because they have splicing. And the splicing prediction of, of um, splice sites is terrible. So, for instance, in toxoplasma, until re very recently, it was just a nightmare. About a third of the proteins that we tried to amplify from cDNA couldn't amplify because they got the splice sites wrong. That's better now because they've corrected them with, with RNA-seq. But in TRIPS, you don't need to worry about that so much. Here's something that I don't have an answer to. About 10% of the time when we mapped the poly A site, it occurred upstream of the CDS. Upstream of the end of the CDS. So, so apparently, the CDS, this RNA stopped before the end of the, uh, of the coding sequence. So, what does that mean? Was that an artifact of the library preparation? Well, some of the time it probably is, but it's probably, this RNA is probably being degraded and then polyadenylated again. So this is probably a non-functional RNA, and we'll come back to that, is that there's probably a lot of RNAs that are non-functional, and they won't be making protein. So we use this information to go in and re-annotate several of the genomes, and here's a case where it was actually sort of important. Here's a gene that uh, in tritrypti B, and this is a few years old, where the L major and the L infantum coding sequence was much longer than the L brasiliensis and the L mexicana coding sequence. And in fact, you know, so they're, they're very similar in all of the organisms up to this methionine here, but then these two organisms had longer open reading frames, and they were pretty similar. So if you'd looked at L infantum, you would have thought the gene was about twice as big as it was in El Brasiliensis, so and you'd get all excited and say, oh, here's a species-specific protein that's obviously important for, for virulence, but you would be wrong. Because when you map the splice leader site, what you see is an L infantum and an L major, the splice leader site maps inside the coding sequence. And in fact, it matches at exactly the same region in the genome as it matches in Brasiliensis, and we haven't done Mexicana. So, this region here is not present in the messenger RNA. This is the, stop this is the start codon for all four organisms. So the protein is essentially identical in all four organisms, even though it's annotated, and it may very well still be annotated in tritripu B as longer than this. And so this is where you need to be very careful. Yes? So if we are Yes. So luckily for, for some of the organisms you now have for L major and for L infantum, there are on tritriptyb RNA-seq data available. 
So you go and you look to see where the splice leader side is, right? And if the splice leader side is here, you don't use that start code. Because I'm in this case, actually, and they told me to see the view node Well, there will be there will multiple potential start codons. A start codon is really an ATG. Yes. So there are probably more ATGs here. I can't. There's another one there. Yeah. Okay. So how do I know that that's not the start codon? Well, I'll give you the answer to that in a few slides. Because you can't tell from this data, yes. but but you can if you do ribosome profiling, as you'll see in a moment. Okay. Right. My. my um, I'm, I'm stressing this because I think it's important that you actually check your data. You don't believe necessarily what's in TriTripDB. Now, if it's wrong 5% of the time, it's right 95% of the time. So you're probably okay. You need to check. The other thing that it will give you is it'll give you uh, novel transcripts. Okay, so here's an example of where we've got this gene here, and I think this is probably the one I just told you. You see, this is actually an internal. Uh, um, ATG, so we got the 5 frame end of this gene wrong. There's a splice leader side here. But then we found another splice leader side up here. A couple of them actually up here. And then there's another poly A side here. So the assumption is that there's another transcript from this region here, which is not associated with the coding sequence in the genome. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to go so far ahead. So the question is, is this a protein coding gene, or is it not? Well, there will be a very small open reading frame in that gene, in that transcript, but whether it codes a protein or not is unknown at this stage. The reason why it didn't get called as a protein coding sequence is it probably failed all of those statistical tests I told you about. So I would say it's very unlikely to be a protein, but we don't know for sure. Uh, but there's certainly an RNA there, and so we need to keep that in mind if we're, if we're uh, interested in that. Some of the re-annotation that's been done has gone in and looked for all of these, and they've actually annotated them as, as potential protein coding genes, and I think that's a little bit misleading, so you have to be careful of that. Uh, but I'll tell you, there is a way around that in a moment, going back to uh, the ribosome profile. All right, so what can we learn from, in, you know, in the real world, what can we learn from RNA-seq? Well, I think you can learn stuff about each of these um, uh, stories here, and I'll give you just one example, of, a couple of examples of each. So here's a story that we did some time ago with Norma Andrews. She was looking at iron starvation. She grew L. Uh, amazonensis in iron-depleted medium, and we did RNA-seq on um, the RNA from... Uh, cells that had iron in, uh, in their medium and those that didn't. And we compared the two. It was a very simple experiment. And we found that 64 genes were upregulated when they were grown in iron-depleted medium. And 68 genes were downregulated when they were grown, grown in medium without iron. Those who were upregulated tended to be involved in transport, so they were upregulating their iron transporters. That makes sense. They were upregulating some other transporters, which doesn't make all that much sense, but they were also upregulating a lot of genes involved in autophagy, so they're not happy and they're starting to degrade protein. What's downregulated? A lot of the things that were downregulated, there were some um, ribosomal proteins because they probably downregulated translation, but there's also a lot of electron transport genes that are downregulated, and those are probably downregulated because those proteins need iron to function. So, um, uh, Norma learned quite a lot from this experiment. Uh, but that's actually a pretty small number of genes that were, were regulated. So that's a, a message that we'll see later on, is that TRIPS don't regulate their RNA levels very much in, in response to uh, nutritional stress. So here's another experiment done with, with uh, Nicola Carter's group on purine starvation. And here we saw a lot more genes that were upregulated by twofold and a lot more that were downregulated, but this was not done in duplicate. And so probably this, we should have gone back and redone this because a lot of these would have fallen out. I always use a twofold cutoff, even though statistically you can find statistically significant differences that are you know, 1.2-fold. I wouldn't trust those. I, don't, I think that if, if it's not at least twofold, 
probably not really all that important, but they, there will be exceptions to that. We can look at stage-specific uh, differences, and here's a, an experiment that I did with uh, Steve Beverly looking at L major, procyclics, metacyclics, and amastigotes, and we found, you know, here, rather than only having a small number of genes, when you look at different stages, promastigotes versus amastigotes versus metacyclics, there are lots of differences in RNA abundance. And there are differences in splice leader site position as well. There are several hundred genes where when you go from pros, they use a different major splice leader site than from AMATs to goats. And there are even more changes in metacyclics. Metacyclics actually look more different uh, from procyclics than they do from, than procyclics look from amastigotes, and that's because metacyclics are not growing. So one of the things that we found is that the major differences, um, if, if your cell is not growing, it looks very different from a cell that's growing. So you have to be very careful that if you're looking at the same cells, that they're both growing under the same, uh, at the same rate, where you'll get differences that have nothing to do with your experiment. They have to do with how well the cell is growing. And in fact, you can do these experiments, and this is one I did with Steve Beverly a number of years ago, where we isolated RNA just from total footpad legions of L major. And we used splice leader RNA seq, and we pulled out only the Leishmania reads. So we were able to use splice leader RNA seq to just get the Leishmania reads in this mishmash of uh, where we sometimes we could barely see the uh, RNA from the parasite, but we could amplify it, and we got quite uh, good results. Um, and we show here that there were not very many uh, genes that, that were different from promastigotes if you look at a fourfold difference. So they were subtle. Uh, this was Greg's experiment, the experiment I did with Greg, looking uh, uh, between axenic and infected uh, macrophages. And what we found is that there were very few differences between axenic amastigotes and macrophage derived um, amastigotes. Uh, and many of those sort of had made sense. There were a lot of things that were transport genes that were upregulated when they were grown in macrophages, presumably because they're in a more um, uh, depleted medium. Um, what was surprising to us when we looked at the difference between cultured promastigotes and, and insects that came out of the guts of, sorry, parasites that came out of the guts for insects of insects, there were a lot more changes. And that's probably back to what Hesus is saying, is that when you sample a, an insect, you're looking at many different stages of the parasite, whereas you're growing it in culture, you're just looking at procyclic promastica. Uh, so those have all been published. I'm not really gonna, this is an experiment we did with Dan Zilberstein, looking at RNA-seq analysis. Um, Lawrence, what's the time? Oh, 20 minutes. All right, I'll, I'll just breeze over this. We don't. We don't care about the numbers very much. This is all being published. The point of this was that we did on exactly the same samples. We did microarrays, RNA-seq, and iTrack. So iTrack measured the protein, uh, different changes in protein. Uh, and so we were able to see a lot of RNA genes, a lot of genes that changed at the RNA level, and we were able to find a lot of proteins that changed at the protein level. And so, um, this is all published. You can see it's been published a number of years ago. There are, there are changes in glucose metabolism protein synthesis that go down when you turn into um, amastigotes and you upregulate beta oxidation and amino acid catabolism. Um, but if you compare the changes in the RNA level with the changes in the protein level, what you find is that there are out of the 8,000 genes in the genome, 900 of them, we had 900 genes where you had both protein data and RNA data, and it was mostly because the protein data didn't sample all that well. And there was a very poor correlation between the RNA level and the protein level. So if you do the correlation here, this is an R squared value of 0.27, which is not terribly impressive. And it was even worse in amastigotes. So there's not a very good correlation between RNA and protein levels. And in fact, only about a third of those 900 genes did the RNA level and the protein level change in the same direction. So we had 300 genes here where both the protein and the RNA level went down, but we only had about 90 cases where the protein and the RNA level went up. We had 66 cases where, sorry, 
66 cases. Oh, it's not going back. Oh, never mind. 66 cases down the bottom where the protein, the RNA level went up, but the protein level went down. And then 132 cases where the RNA level went down and the protein level went up. And then 115 cases where the RNA level went down and the protein stayed the same. So probably half of the cases, and then there were about a few cases where there were really um, nothing happened. So almost half of the cases, uh, half of the genes that we looked at, there was a difference between the change in the RNA level and the change in the protein level. So really you can't reliably use the change in the RNA level to predict that there's a change in the protein level. It works about a third of the time. Maybe, maybe a half of the time. So why is that? Well, that's where ribosome profiling comes in. So what ribosome profiling does is it not only measures the total RNA level, you make your libraries in such a way that you split your library into two. You make total RNA from the cell, but you also isolate ribosomes, and you, del you um, freeze the ribosomes on the RNA, and then you digest all the RNA that's not protected by the ribosome. And you make a library out of the RNA that's been protected by the ribosome. So what you're doing is you're looking at what portion of the message RNA is being translated at that moment that you isolated the cells. And you compare that to the total RNA level in the cell. And you get data that looks sort of like this. Oops. So here, what we've got in the light green uh, is the total RNA level. And you can see here, this gene here is very high, has very high uh, messenger RNA levels. There's a lot of messenger RNA level, messenger RNA. But the dark green is not translated all that well. And if, in fact, if we go here, it becomes even more obvious. What we can do is we can measure what's called the translation efficiency, which is where we divide the number of reads in the ribosome profiling by the number of reads in the RNA. And that gives you a measure of how efficiently that RNA is, is, um, is translated. And we can look for changes in the translation efficiency where there are no changes in the RNA level. And so here's an example of that. If you look here, I'm comparing messenger RNA at zero hours versus messenger RNA at 24 hours. And you can see and for this region here, they're really pretty much the same. Now, it looks like there's more RNA here, but that's because there's more total reads in this library. In this view, they're not normalized. If you normalize them, they look very similar. Whereas at zero hours, there's essentially no ribosome profiling reads. But at 24 hours, there's a lot of ribosome profiling reads. So this would be a gene that if you looked at the RNA level, you would say, hmm, nothing interesting here. But it's being upregulated, its translation is being upregulated enormously. Turns out that actually, and this is back to an earlier question, if you look at the splice leader RNA libraries, you see that there were no splice leaders in this region at zero hours, but now you're seeing splice leader processing here at 24 hours. So what's happening is that you're processing the RNA differently and you're making another messenger RNA that now becomes translated. And you would not have seen that from a traditional um, RNA-seq library. How important is that? Well, I think it's important, because if you look at the experiment that we did looking between promastigotes and amastigotes, axenic promastigotes and amastigotes, there's about 1,500 genes that that change at the RNA level. But if you look at changes in translational level, there's a lot more of them. And there's, in fact, even more genes where they change their translational um, efficiency. So a third of all of the genes in the Leishmania genome change their translational efficiency between life cycle stages. Now, most of these are probably fairly subtle, and they may not, may not be important. And many of them, probably that's just a reflection of a global decrease in protein synthesis that occurs in, in amastigotes. So, so there are many more genes where the translational efficiency goes down in uh, amastigotes. But you would have not have seen that necessarily if, if you just looked at the RNA. Why is splice leader RNA sequencing important? 
because here's a case where we see a change in the splice leader abundance at uh, one time point. Here's a case where the total number of splice leader reads doesn't change, and in fact the total RNA level doesn't really change, but we've moved from having two splice leader sites, in fact this is the major one, to here where you've changed the major splice leader site, and then you can also have cases where both things change. And why is that important? Well, here's a case where we actually have some data. Here's a case where, uh, it's a protein phosphatase, where at, um, I believe the green here is the, oh, this is what we're comparing is the, the, the uh, splice leader site at zero hours, pro, uh, promastigotes, to the uh, abundance of the splice leader site at, um, at 120 hours. And you can see that this one at minus 280 starts off being the minor site, but in amastigotes it becomes the major site. When you look at the total RNA levels, they don't change. Same number, same amount of RNA at both life cycle stages, but the protein level changes a lot. And so what it appears is happening is that you've, you've moved the splice leader site closer to the ATG, and that's caused the RNA to be translated less well. And so we have to prove that. That's a hypothesis, but we haven't. We haven't proved it yet, but we know that the RNA, the protein level goes down and we know that the splice leader site gets closer. Now, just to show that that isn't a general example, here's an example that's exactly the opposite. Here, there's no change in the RNA level. This major splice leader site gets closer to the RNA, goes to the ATG just like we saw before, uh, although it is a little bit more subtle. But here, the protein level goes up. So it looks as though, at least in some of the cases, the change in translation might have to do with moving the splice leader site around. And I've shown you three examples of that. What I haven't shown you is all of the other examples where the splice leader site doesn't move and you still see changes in translation efficiency. So, um, in summary, you need to make different RNA-seq libraries to answer different questions. And so, you know, you might make a total RNA library if you're interested in RNA abundance. That will give you a pretty good answer to most things, but it won't be all, uh, give you the total answer all the time. You might make a splice lead RNA library if you want to ask a slightly different question, and then you might write some profiling libraries if you really want to get a better picture overall of what's going on. Uh, this is pretty much done now for many organisms. Um, in general, there's little response to nutritional stress at the RNA level, but there's extensive stage-specific regulation of RNA levels and of splice leader selection. But what's important is that there's a lot of translational control that you'll miss if you just rely on RNA-seq. Uh, and I'll leave it at that, and we'll go this afternoon to play with some real RNA-seq data where you can start fiddling around with it yourself.